I'd like to welcome Dr. Judy Shelton. Uh, Dr. Judy and I have spoken many times, but this is the first time I'm speaking with her in the capacity of uh, the president nominated her to be a potential Fed governor. To that end, Dr. Judy, you saw today's jobs report. Maybe you can give me some thoughts. It was definitely a bit stronger than many had hoped for, and maybe it even changes the philosophy of what to expect from the Federal Reserve. Well, first I want to compliment you, Rick, because you called it. And uh, coming in at 224, that was fantastic. Um, I think it shows that the pro-growth economic agenda under the administration is working. I think it shows that economies really do respond to positive policies that help create a better environment for businesses to be successful so they can hire people. We see gains in productivity. That justifies the gains in wages, which is fantastic. And um, it's, it's paying off. And, and the, the numbers today are testimony to that. Now, having said that, and I agree with much of what you said, but I also see that you are advocating at least the last several pieces I've either read about you or interviews with you that you think an ease is in the cards, so to speak. And you could correct me in your answer if I'm wrong. My issue is I see all the things you see, and I hope we have sound money policies, and maybe we don't blink too early with regard to our insurance hikes. We had nine of them bringing us to the current level, two and a quarter to two and a half. So how does lowering rates dovetail with your historic stance on sound money? Well, I think what we've seen is that central banks have been engaged in policies that have created a disconnect between the real economy and the interaction between central banks and financial markets. So my concern is that now that we're getting things going the right way because of genuine um, impact having policies that are raising the, the growth potential, I don't want to cut liquidity to that. Um, I think that markets are set up, this is why we see a negative reaction to what is really good news for the idea that they've been, they've been taught to believe in. And when you, when you consider that more than half of American households are invested through mutual funds or pension funds in this market, I don't want the Fed to pull the rug out from under them by, by taking a position that is not conducive to further providing the liquidity for this growing economy. We have, we have two scary things that, you know, I look at the international aspects. One is this yield curve where you have the Federal Reserve paying interest on excess reserves, the Fed funds rate of 2.35%. And then you have a 10-year Treasury at, what, two, even under two it has been? 205, I just traded, 205. That practice that's very damaging. It's, it's very damaging to the incentive for banks to provide financial capital to small businesses. Um, they are being paid for leaving money sitting in a deposit account at the Federal Reserve. Now, Dr. Judy, in let nothing, me stop you. Not even Dr. Treasury. Judy, let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. I agree. So really the issue is I just don't see that lowering interest rates a quarter or half a point over a couple of different meetings, is that really going to address the liquidity? I look overseas and they are big spoonfuls of liquidity, negative interest rates, 13 trillion of them, and they don't seem to ever seem to make out the promised land of where they want policy to go. I don't understand why a quarter or a half point is going to make a difference, but even more to the point than that, everything that you are bringing up, in my opinion, means if we start giving up our quarter point tightenings, those nine I referenced, doesn't that almost assure if there's really the type of crisis that demands the attention of our central bank, does that relegate us to go into negative rates when we start using up those quarter point tightenings as tools right now? Well, I think it's hard to normalize, which is what you would be expecting, when the mechanism for doing so is creating this disincentive. And when we're paying the banks not to invest, including foreign-owned banks, we have a problem in that we could be punished for our successful reforms because they're not doing it in Europe. They're not making the hard policy choices that bring about authentic growth. And to me, it's unfair to punish our successful producers 
when we, we can recognize that Europe is headed toward additional stimulus measures, which is code for saying they're prepared to devalue the euro. And let's say the euro were to fall against the dollar 5%. But if you lower like rates in a, a relatively on strong exports. economy, our, but if we lower rates at a time, and I understand you have the freak get out of jail card, inflation. Yes, it's underperforming. But once again, I ask the question, does a quarter or half point really make a difference? We've been under uh, the inflation targets for the most part since the Volcker years. So the real question then becomes, if we lower to make the dollar less strong, aren't we as guilty as there with faulty policy? Well, I think we need to confront what's happening. I think central bankers put on these blinders and we play by these Marquis to Queensbury rules where we, we have plausible deniability. And, and it's clear that interest rate policies do have an impact on currencies. And to pretend that they don't is, is a mistake. This is the challenge for central banking. How do you have a, a level monetary playing field that allows the principles of free trade to be upheld. And just as we're calling out our trade partners on other unfair trade practices, I think that we can't ignore the impact of differential interest rate policies on that currency relationship. Normally you would raise if you had inflation on the horizon. We don't have that. And, and so I don't want to punish the U.S. economy, which is flourishing by doing the right things, by making us vulnerable. I don't see where the punishment's coming in, I guess. By... Where's the punishment? Where's the punishment? Where can I look up and say, oh my God, quarter of 50 basis points less than this two and a quarter to 250 target, and all of a sudden this area is going to light up? We'll get a little nitrous boost, but you know, we're down 128 in the Dow with a strong number. I think the equity markets is getting used to the fact that maybe a good economy isn't so bad. Well, it would be nice if we didn't have a perverse reaction to good news, but we see that we do. The problem is you reap what you sow. And so central bank easing has created this environment. And I, I don't think markets are wrong in questioning the yield curve because you have 13 trillion in negatively, uh, negative yield debt out there. So it's, it's almost an impossible situation to be having the short-term Fed funds And now the, this so impossible higher. situation in Europe, Dr. Judy, is going to have a new leader that tries to paint a, a palatable exit. So there's going to be a handoff for Mario Draghi, potentially, it's not set in stone, uh, to Christine Lagarde, IMF chair. Thoughts not on the nature of the job, we know what that is, but it certainly seems as though Christine Lagarde's more of a politician, former finance chief with regard to France. Is this the type of political arrangement that you think is going to find a way to grow Europe again and get over their structural issues? Or is this just going to be more negative rates and people only buying sovereign securities of the southern economies because some knucklehead behind them is willing to buy it at a higher price that's more negative in yield? Well, I'm afraid I, I see the latter scenario. And, and it's interesting for all of the accusations that people make around the world that somehow the U.S. has abandoned the rules-based global trading order. That global trading order really traces back to 1944 and an agreement by 44 nations that they would not devalue their currencies, that we would have a stable currency platform so that you could really uphold free trade and that capital would flow to its best use. To me, the irony today is that the IMF often advocates uh, its recipient countries that they should devalue their currencies, that they could then be um, more competitive. But I think competitive depreciation is not competitive. It's, it's cheating, not competing, because it, it gives you an advantage against uh, your rivals, and, and I believe in competition, but I don't think it's fair that through just monetary sleight of hand, you get a price advantage. That's not fair well, to Dr. the whole Judy, I'm gonna let you, of having Dr. Judy, I'm going to let you in, in on a little market. secret. Over the next couple of weeks, my guess is you're going to get hit hardest with respect to conversations regarding whether you're the right nominee or not, because you've advocated in the past strong money, which advocated maybe more of the gold standard. Now, that ended in 71. 
but maybe you can explain to the audience, you know, as I see Bitcoin since April over triple its price, as I see gold going up and down, it's pretty plain to see that the world is desperate for something that is a better storage of money than copy machines that have pictures of presidents or nice colors on them and they're called money. I, I think that when I hear Snickers, when we talk about convertible bonds into gold for various countries, the fact that there's Snickers at all really depresses me. Nobody seems open-minded to protect what's in our wallets. Can you finish out telling me why that potential should be considered? Well, Rick, what I would want to bring to this position is the willingness to examine the fundamental question that I think is at the heart of what you just sketched out. Money is meant to serve as a reliable measure. It's really the key to free market capitalism. You have to send signals about prices by having um, clarity. And money's supposed to be that unit of account that provides it. It's supposed to be a dependable store of value. It's not supposed to be just another government policy instrument to try to engineer outcomes. And what we've seen is central banks trying too hard to do just that. And they've engineered us right into a negative rate scenario, which completely undermines the idea of having faith in the future, which is the very virtue of capitalism, that people have a positive outlook. They think it's worth it to sacrifice today, to save instead of consuming, to invest that financial seed corn in the possibility of a greater harvest. And, and it's that kind of financial intermediation that actually creates a higher standard of living, that brings opportunity and prosperity. That's what we want to foster, not a continuing uh, speculative game that's just played in a, in a 5.1 trillion daily turnover currency market. Excellent. Dr. Judy Shelton, thanks for an abundance of your time. I'm sure it's going to be a wild ride until we get that vote. Uh, hope yeah. it turns out in your favor. Wilf, back to you.